dinosaurs have mesmerized people since they first appeared in museums. They planned the museum around that dinosaur. They I really thought about what was going into the museum when they designed it. It's hard not to think that the drama of the exhibit didn't enter into their minds. But for decades, much of what we've seen has been wrong. I mean, if you look at how we reconstruct hadrosaurs nowadays, the animal looks, you know, essentially completely different. Now, an ongoing dinosaur renaissance is affecting exhibits around the world. Everything you see in our shop revolves around building dinosaurs. And it may seem an awful lot for a little bit of bone, but you have to remember these things are priceless. You can't just go to the corner store and buy a hadrosaur. I think every new museum that opens a fossil exhibition creates a new model, a new step forward, and everybody else tries to learn from what, what everyone else has done. There's a certain amount of fear that, that goes into the job. There's the fear of getting it wrong. It's a Jurassic journey so dramatic, you won't see dinosaurs the same way again. Come on in. Welcome to the Jurassic parking lot. This impressive dinosaur is a Carithosaurus, a hadrosaur with a trademark helmet-crested head. It was mounted for the new wing of the Royal Ontario Museum in 1932 and towered over visitors for more than 70 years. This original mount was so tall, the building was even designed around it. Well, that wing as such, the floor of the Queen's Park wing, which was constructed and, and opened in 1932, was part of a huge addition of the museum that was conceived in about 1929 and built and opened in 1932. That particular floor of that wing has an extra high ceiling to accommodate a particular dinosaur, and that was the big Carithosaurus hadrosaur that um, they knew was going to be extra tall, because back then they assumed that these guys stood up on their hind legs, and this was a very long dinosaur, so when it stood up on its hind legs, it was going to be very tall, about 17 feet tall when it was finished being mounted. They planned the museum around that dinosaur, and that's not the only thing they planned it around. They I really thought about what was going into the museum when they designed it. The formidable creature was an impressive sight. And when a five-year-old David Evans saw it for the first time, it was a moment that changed his life. My uncle actually uh, brought me here when I was about five years old and took me around the wrong gallery. And it was here that I saw my first dinosaur skeletons in real life, and that had a real impact on me. The experience cemented his early passion for fossils and eventually led him to a career in paleontology. Well, if you walked into the, the ROM gallery like I did when I was five, uh, the Carithosaurus was, was amazing. You would see an animal that was sort of in sort of a squatting pose. The tail would be mostly dragging along the ground. Um, the knees would be rather flexed. And the backbone would be sending the, uh, the neck and head very high within the rafters. I think that the head was held about 18 feet off the floor and basically dinosaurs and paleontology have, have been with me ever since. But there is one problem with this exhibit. It's wrong, and the museum has known it for about 30 years. It's hard not to think that the drama of the exhibit um, didn't enter into their minds. You know, putting an 18-foot-tall Tyrannosaurus rex in an exhibit or putting the duckbill standing 17 feet tall is, uh, is something that you know would really resonate in the minds of the museum visitors, and it certainly makes for a much more dramatic exhibit. Turns out that's not how the dinosaurs would have stood in their normal stance, in their relaxing posture, how they were walking. Um, the backbones were held essentially horizontal. Um, the legs were much less flexed. Uh, they weren't bent as much as at the knee, and the tail didn't drag along the ground. Remounting dinosaurs is a difficult and costly job, and museums have been slow to catch up with the science. However, the Royal Ontario Museum is in the throes of a major renovation, which will include a dramatic new dinosaur gallery when it's finished. Now it's up to today's paleontologists to use the fossils to unlock the mysteries of the dinosaurs and mount them correctly for the first time. And many of the major museums, including the Royal Ontario Museum here, uh, the American Museum of Natural History, Field Museum in Chicago, many of these big um, institutions that we all know of uh, are really just 
getting their dinosaur displays up to what we knew, but museums take a while to catch up because mounting things is a really difficult task. And so, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the major museums now are just catching up to what we found out 30 years ago. And now the five-year-old who stood in awe at the feet of that 17-foot tall Carithosaurus is part of the team charged with remounting that very dinosaur. No, I think that looks good. That looks good to me because the footprint should overlap. David Evans is now one of the world's leading experts on hadrosaurs, or duck-billed dinosaurs. It's why the ROM hired him to be one of its dinosaur curators, even though he's still in university finishing his PhD on the subject. My interest in duck-billed dinosaurs sort of uh, fell into my lap. It was given to me as a, as a project at the Royal Terrell Museum when I was there as a summer student. And uh, it was suggested to look at a particular duckbill skull and look at how this particular duckbill, Carithosaurus, grew. And from there, I got into the literature and I, I got in looking at the fossil record of duckbills, particularly from Canada. And the one thing that sticks out in particular, um, basically in, in all uh, facets of, of hadrosaurs, is their fossil record. Their fossil record is absolutely amazing. Um, more specimens of hadrosaurs are known um, than most uh, other dinosaurs. And uh, these include fossils that range from uh, embryonic remains, eggshells, nests, and complete articulated skulls and skeletons from juveniles through adults. And it's with this really unprecedented sample that you can uh, gain uh, unique insights into um, these dinosaurs' biology and the way they lived and died. Well, hadrosaurs, they evolved in the late Cretaceous period, somewhere around 100 million years ago. And they inhabited uh, the river deltas and swampy lowlands and floodplains of uh, North America and Asia. Um, they were the most common herbivores in these late Cretaceous ecosystems, at least in North America and Asia. What sets hadrosaurs apart from uh, closely related dinosaurs is uh, their extremely complex uh, dentition. Um, they have uh, dental batteries that are formed from hundreds of teeth which are in the mouth at the same time and these teeth grew continuously and they formed a dental battery which they used to process plant material uh, much more efficiently than uh, any other dinosaurs around at the time and it's this uh, likely key adaptation in their uh, uh, dentition and chewing mechanisms that really allowed them to take off in number and once they, they spread out um, they diversified quickly into a great range of forms, some of them that, that have very unique types of, of ornamentation on their skulls, which was used for, for social sig signaling uh, and the like. But the, the real uh, important thing in hadrosaur evolution was the development of these complex dentitions for processing plant material. But the answer to the problem of the incorrectly mounted Carithosaurus lay not in its teeth, but in its hands. And it's in this high security part of the building that we find a rare set of fossils that have proven to be an important piece of that paleontological puzzle. Well, this is the hand of uh, Parasaurolophus. It's a crested duckbill dinosaur. And the first thing to notice uh, about the hand in general is that it lacks a thumb. So this is the left hand, and this is my left hand, and you can see the area for the thumb which you typically use for grasping, um, is, is completely gone, and it's actually lost in all hadrosaurs. The hand has been one key to unlocking the mystery of the hadrosaur, specifically how it walked the earth millions of years ago. This here is, is the pinky finger, which is elongated. Uh, when you study the hand um, in animals that use the hand for grasping, the finger bones of the digits tend to be elongated. As you see here, uh, the finger bones of duckbills are in fact very reduced. And two of the digits, uh, digits two and three, um, are capped with very small hoof-like ungules. And these would have been capped in life by a keratinous sheath and would have actually been hooves. If the interpretation of the fossils is right, the hand is actually a foot, a finding that's only reinforced when paleontologists looked even closer at how the dinosaurs were standing. It starts in the sort of the, in the late 60s and the early 70s when there was a group of scientists um, that started to really think critically uh, about how we know what we knew about dinosaurs and how they lived and how we, you know, we, we viewed dinosaurs and how they, they stood and behaved. And they started to look critically at these old mounts. 
And what they realized when they looked at the anatomy is that, you know, in, in the case of the hadrosaurs, virtually all specimens that um, had been found were preserved with a very straight backbone um, that was essentially horizontal um, to the legs. These 75 million year old fossilized bones are part of the mounting evidence that's causing museums around the world to rebuild their collections. It seems obvious in retrospect, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's just how science progresses. You know, sometimes you get things right and sometimes you get things wrong. And, uh, you know, whether when people come back to that or realize the importance of, of these things that have been missed is, you know, completely arbitrary and contingent. You know, you don't know when it, you know, you don't know when it's gonna, when it's gonna happen. Getting anatomy right is basically the first step of interpreting dinosaur paleobiology. Behind me is the skeleton of Inmontosaurus, a large duck-billed dinosaur that lived about 70 million years ago. Unlike the Corythosaurus, which was mounted straight up in the old gallery, this skeleton has all four feet on the ground. When scientists were reconsidering the posture of duckbills and other dinosaurs in the late 60s and early 70s, they pointed to several uh, key anatomical features of the backbone and the pelvis that suggested that they weren't um, as upright as previously thought. In special reference to the duckbills, the vertebral column was particularly important. Although they're not preserved on this specimen here, uh, all duckbills have a series of ossified tendons or very stiff bony struts that would have covered the top of the backbone and ran from the middle of the tail all the way through the shoulders. And this would have made the tail region extremely stiff and the upright posture in which the tail is dragging on the, along the ground would have been impossible in life. The second piece of anatomy has to do with the structure of the hips. When the vertebral column is upright, uh, the weight of the animal has to be carried across a very weak joint between the ilium, the upper hip blades, and a lower bone of the uh, hips, the pubis. And it is unlikely that, the, that this joint could have supported um, the weight of the animal for long periods of time. When the vertebral column is horizontal, um, the animal carries the weight through the most robust portion of the pelvis, which is the, the iliac blade here. Now, if we have the vertebral column straight as it's mounted here, this has effects on the position of the shoulder girdle and the arms. It brings the shoulders much lower than the level of the hips, which is very much different from the old Corythosaurus mounted in the gallery with the arms much higher than the hips. With the shoulder girdle, girdle much lower, this allows the arms to reach the ground and the hands, in fact, to touch the ground. And this explains the hooves on the bottoms of the hands and the arms would have been used uh, as they would have um, in life, which was for walking. The findings are part of an ongoing dinosaur renaissance that's challenged the way we think about the prehistoric giants. But it doesn't just apply to the duck-billed dinosaurs. It also applies to Tyrannosaurus rex, the quintessential dinosaur that people visualize towering overhead. It was the norm in all the children's books. The hadrosaurs and um, the tyrannosaurs were standing with their backbones essentially upright in a sort of squatting position. I and mean, we look at them now and they, they look very slow and, and you know, almost, almost ridiculous. But that was, uh, that was the way that dinosaurs were, were thought of at the time, very slow, dim-witted, uncoordinated. And uh, the reconstructions that sort of proverberated through the popular literature you know, really reinforced that. And that came from the way that these skeletons were originally mounted. I mean, the T-Rex in the American Museum of Natural History, that, that first mount, it's a, absolutely iconic um, of that T-Rex with that, that tail dragging on the ground and the backbone essentially upright and with the head in the rafters, of course. And, uh, you know, those, those uh, powerful images of T-Rex and the duckbills standing, you know, straight, straight upright from, you know, thought of that way by almost a generation of scientists, I mean, that has some staying power. So a lot of the work on dinosaur postures and correcting how, you know, T-Rex stood and how the, the duckbills stood and getting those dragging tails off the ground, um, that work, you know, really stems from the work done in the 70s. But, uh, you know, museums, uh, many of the uh, exhibits that um, are, are in museums have been there for decades. And museums right now are basically just trying to catch up to the, the huge body of, of knowledge that we've accumulated on dinosaurs in the last 30 years since the, since the dinosaur renaissance. And the Royal Ontario Museum is undergoing a renaissance of its own. As the museum counts down to the opening day of its new dinosaur exhibit, it's up to a team of highly specialized craftsmen 
to take the ROM's priceless collection of ancient bones and rebuild them. Reinterpreting dinosaur anatomy is a challenging task with much at stake. When we return, we go behind the scenes for a sneak peek at the work underway on the ROM's family of dinosaurs. It's an image that's imprinted on the minds of millions by museums and the media. A Tyrannosaurus Rex towering ferociously on its hind legs. But it turns out T-Rex and other dinosaurs have been mounted incorrectly. This information is not new, but most exhibits have been slow to set the story straight. Now museums like the Royal Ontario Museum are on a mission to completely rebuild their collections. And that massive undertaking requires some help. Enter Research Casting International. Housed in a nondescript concrete building an hour south of Toronto, Ontario, it doesn't look like much from the outside. But inside is another universe. Hi, my name is Peter May, and, and this is my company, Research Casting International. We're a small Canadian company based in Beamsville, Ontario, and we specialize in building dinosaurs for museums throughout the world. We build, build dinosaur skeletons like you see behind me. Uh, we mold, we cast. We want large skeletons, small skeletons, everything from the smallest uh, myosaur baby all the way up to the gigantic T-Rex attacking other skeletons and other animals. We've been in business since uh, 1987. Over the years, we've worked for um, pretty well every museum in the world on every continent. We worked on the movie Jurassic Park, for instance, we, we did a lot there. And there we had to sign a clause saying nobody could say anything about any of the work that was going on. And an awful lot of the major museums are like that as well. Because when they do open, it ha has to be brand new to the world. And, and here we see it all probably for a year, year and a half ahead of time. And, and we know what's going to be seen. But, you know, we do have to be, um, be discreet about it. And the people at Research Casting International have their work cut out for them. Yet another dinosaur skeleton has arrived from the ROM in pieces, and now it's up to them to put it back together. It's a unique blend of art, science, and technology that gets the job done. We have a staff of about 30 people, and they range in talent. We have, uh, we have people with master's degrees in fine arts. We have people with BAs and major in fine art. We have uh, artists, we have sculptors, we have uh, blacksmiths, uh, metal workers. Our staff have been pretty well trained on the job. We, uh, we just expect our employees to come in and, and have a good basic skill with their hands, you know, to be able to use small hand tools, um, be comfortable around tools building things, and have a good sense of um, how an animal moves. We've built probably over 250 skeletons, so if somebody has a uh, a pet and they watch their dog and how their dog moves and how it chases other animals and things like that. It, it helps them understand w what our skeletons do and, and what the, the people in museums are looking for. E everything you see in our shop revolves around building dinosaurs. If it's a cast, if it's a mold, if it's original fossil material, if we're doing the preparation of the, the bone, if we're conserving the bone, if we're scanning bone, digitally scanning it and printing it, everything we do here revolves around building dinosaurs. For years, the Corythosaurus, or helmet-headed hadrosaur, dominated the ROM. In fact, they made one of the wings extra high just to accommodate it. But scientists now know the dinosaur never actually stood that way. Now the pressure is on people at Research Casting International to get it right. There's a certain amount of fear that, that goes into the job and w w without the experience where we could have an employee putting uh, the manus together, or the hand, of a hadrosaur together for the very first time. And, and they've never done it before. So um, there's the fear of getting it wrong. The biggest fear would be for, for anything to fall down or any, any of the bones to break. Um, and that, of course, there's the more practical things, like making sure that the, uh, the mount is as realistic as possible and that di the dinosaur's posture uh, fits what we know about that animal in terms of its anatomy. And it's as accurate uh, an image as we can present to the public. Just making sure that we, we have 
an anatomically correct mount and that it's, um, you know, since they are doing brand new galleries at the ROM, they should be as current as, as the science is. And, and, and I think the challenge is just, just being correct on, on that side of things. Um, there aren't really a, any unknowns that we ha haven't worked with in the past. To piece it together, the same step-by-step -step process is followed for any collection of dinosaur fossils that come into the building. Let me start at the beginning. When we um, start a project, the first thing we do is dismantle the skeleton. So, so we're at the museum, we, um, we take the whole skeleton apart, and we, we take the in individual fossils, uh, we, we package them up, we, we put them in our specimen cabinets. Their skeletons have been collected over time. Every specimen they have is unique. A lot of times the, the museums ask us to break the shipment up so that we'll have half a skeleton in one truck, half a skeleton in another truck, so that if anything does happen to that truck, they're not going to lose everything. The Royal Ontario Museum, for instance, their collection started probably <clears throat> back in the late 1800s, and dinosaur skeletons are fairly unique, and the collection they have there is probably one of the best collections in the world, and if they lose any of that, they're losing part of the world's history. So we have special cabinets. We have cabinets which have shock absorbers on it. We can strap a frame to the truck and the, the cabinet will ride on uh, an air ride system sort of thing. Um, and it may seem an awful lot for a little bit of bone, but you have to remember these things are priceless. You know, they, you, you can't just go to the corner store and buy a hadrosaur. Once they're at the shop, we um, un unpack everything, document any damage that has occurred to the animals, to, to the individual bones of the animals. We take it upstairs to our conservation room where, where it's put, put into drawers. The drawers from our cabinets fit the, the drawers we have here, so we, we only handle the specimens once. We, we take them off exhibit, we'll put them in the drawers. From those drawers, go back into our cabinets. Then when it's time to, to clean and consolidate the, the skeleton, we, we take the individual bones out, we um, clean off the old consolidants, uh, historically, we're usually dealing with uh, varnishes, shellacs, um, horse glues, old, old adhesives, which um, aren't, aren't very stable. You know, over the years, that they crystallize, deteriorate, and, and things break. We take away as, as much as we can of, of the old materials. Um, then we introduce new materials, safe consolidants, safe adhesives, which have been time-tested, and time-tested probably from the 60s till now, but it's not very long. And if the bone breaks, it's okay, because it's under control. Like, we, we, we have it in our lab, so if an adhesive breaks, if, if a joint breaks and, and we have the bone opening, it's okay, because then it helps us introduce more consolidant into the actual fossil. Plus, what we can do is glue it back together with, with a much better adhesive, a more modern adhesive. Once the fossils are cleaned, they start building the armatures. The custom-made steel pieces will hold and connect the fossils together. Then we'll start to build the skeleton. And, and there we build, um, if, if it's real fossil material, then we build individual armatures for every piece of bone throughout the whole skeleton. There's many different ways of mounting a skeleton. Um, what we try to do is bring the art of the blacksmith into play with the skeleton. So we have... Um, very, very good blacksmiths here. And, and they have a very good sense of um, doing their craft, bending their steel, and making it uh, become an organic part of the skeleton itself. Because it, it has to be mounted. You, you can mount it um, just uh, a piece of steel with a bone on it. And, and I, we've seen some very, very crude mounts where they have, haven't taken advantage of um, the skill of the hominid with the, uh, the, the beauty of the specimen or something like that. You know, so, so it's a combination of uh, the, you know, the art and the craft of, uh, of us as human beings uh, combined with the, uh, the beauty of the organic shapes of, of the skeleton and the bones themselves. And we've made it so that all, all the individual bones can be removed for study. If, if, if they want to remove any of the bones, for study, they're, they're able to do that. Once the armatures are built, then the skeleton's assembled. You know, you look at this here, and I was doing what the picture yeah. says, so I'm trying to soften 
what's happening there in the neck. Usually what happens is the um, exhibit designers um, give us drawings of uh, how they'd like the skeletons mounted. We, we stick as close as we can to that um, because those drawings usually come from the exhibit designers in conjunction with the paleontologists at the museum. And, and they dictate w what positioning they want and what sort of field that they want to have in, in their galleries. How was this mounted before? It was mounted with a vertebra called almost vertical. So it stood, I think, about 18 feet, feet high. The tail was bent with, the, um, with it on the ground. And so what we're doing now, we're, we're doing, we're changing the positioning completely. So now, is this what the way they believe they, they should be standing now? Yeah, with the vertebral column more or less horizontal, the uh, tail straight and off the ground. And with the vertebral column doing that dive at the shoulders to bring the shoulder girdle down and the front limbs close to the ground, which where they would have been used in walking. We're working today probably with the one of the brightest minds dealing with the Lambisaurines. And he, he's helping us go through all of this. So, and he's looked at the past science, and he's introducing the new science. I'm not doing anything unique uh, that's different from any paleontologist. I'm certainly looking at uh, a lot of these old hadrosaur fossils that haven't been looked at in several decades in a completely new new light, and with different techniques and methodologies to uh, shed light on on how they evolved. So this whole armature will come off, so you could get basically get, get rid of all the metal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not guiding the technicians per se, but they've come to me with a lot of different questions when they don't see the bones going together right or when they, um, for instance, put two bones together and they, they see something that looks odd to them. Um, they'll come to me with their, their questions and I'll pop in every now and again to see the process as it, as it goes along uh, to double check their work and what they've been doing. And again, to make sure that everything makes sense in terms of um, how that animal is put together and how it's presented to to the public in the new new galleries. And so it's definitely made me think about you know, how these things really do go together and how they would, would have moved and functioned as animals. And you know, how we know what we supposedly know. It's, it's often difficult for uh, paleontologists who work with very large animals to get a sense of just how the bones go together because a femur of a duckbill, for instance, is over a meter long and will weigh uh, tens of kilograms and it's very difficult to manipulate. So working with uh, the research casting crew and looking at uh, how these skeletons actually go together, fit together, and how the, the dinosaur would have likely stood and walked and moved in, in real life has, has definitely been a, a, a highlight um, of the process. It's, it's just very interesting to, to, to see these big bones actually go together. It's, it's something that um, is, a, is a difficult thing to, to, to do when you have bones on a table especially of dinosaurs. There's a little bit of room for interpretation and ultimately, you know, I answer, I answer to myself. And so I try to make the decisions based on the facts that I have at hand and consulting the literature and try to make sure everything checks up. And, but some of the details are certainly uh, up for debate and up for interpretation. And uh, that's just the nature of science. When we return, we reveal more secrets about the art and science of remounting ancient dinosaur bones. And the Royal Ontario Museum's famous Carithosaurus takes its new and final shape. stars of many museums. Giant, ferocious-looking beasts from a prehistoric era. But the image most of us have of them has been all wrong. Using modern methodologies and current science, the ROM's David Evans and a team of dinosaur reconstruction experts have been working to get it right. Now, months after the remounting work began, the Carithosaurus, one of the stars of the Royal Ontario Museum's dinosaur collection, is taking its final shape. So we start mounting here, and then if we have any questions, like if the animal can't go in that pose, we'll let them know, and we'll come out and discuss it. And how the, if we have any question articulation, if, if there's something unique about the specimen, we, we stay in contact with the museum, with the, the paleontologist at the museum. If it's a brand, brand new find, for instance, um, usually 
they don't have all the information. So what we're doing is uh, doing the best we, we can w w with what we've got and what they've got. Sometimes it's a best guess scenario, but it's usually pretty good. Sometimes there's compromises that you have to make, and certainly there are some things that uh, I would like to see done that uh, are, you know, they're just not feasible. There's a, been a lot of, uh, of study that's gone on before me, and uh, there's a lot of science that allows us to put these skeletons back together and be reasonably confident that we're, we're, we're pretty close. Ultimately, it comes down to experience and intuition when trying to figure out where all the bones will go. It's very important that we're anatomically correct. You know, like as far as the, the, the mechanics of the vertebra, the mechanics of the legs and the articulation of the bones, we have to be a, a, as accurate as we can. Um, an awful lot of the time, what happens with the bone, it be becomes distorted over time. Like, these bones have been buried underground for tens of millions of years. And what we have to do is fit them back together. And if there's any distortion in the uh, articular surface at the joint, it's hard to get it right. Then how does the animal walk? You know, like, what's it doing? So, so then there's trackways. So we look at trackways and say, you know, like, the published papers on trackways and things like that, we look at that and see how this animal walked and then, how fast was it going? How fast can it go? You know, can you put it in a, um, an attack position if, if it's a carnivore? Um, was it a scavenger? Or did it attack? Was it a hunter? You know, and all those, those things come together. So, and, and that affects the posture of the animal. Um, and in the old days, when they, they mount a lot of skeletons, they had them upright, tails on the ground. Um, you do find trackways with a tail, tail drag. But it doesn't mean all, all, all these animals were in that posture all the time. So now the main um, way of articulating most skeletons is horizontal, carrying the weight on their legs and the, the body balancing. Aesthetically, I, I think it is critical. You, you know, like the mount has to be uh, a very good mount. You know, like if you walk into a museum and uh, you have two legs planted and one leg's an, an inch off the deck and the other one's four inches off the deck, it just doesn't look good. What, what happens in uh, doing work for museums, the, the work is uh, studied. You, you'll have people go to a museum and, and they'll sit in a chair and they'll look at a specimen for hours. And, and they'll sit there and if they see something wrong, they spot it. it you know, it's not like a movie where it's, it's fleeting, you know, like the bones aren't upside down or this isn't right or that isn't right. So we have to be very, very careful that we're as tight as, as we can be and, and, and as accurate as we can be. Most pale, paleontologists are pretty polite. If we do something wrong, they don't usually tell us right away. <laughs> they'll wait a couple of years and they'll say, did you know you're doing that wrong? Um, because it, it does happen. It, it, you know, it's, it still does happen. Like, we have 30 employees here putting things together, you know, and um, every once in a while, like, something will slip through the crack and go out that's a little bit off, not quite right. But we, we stand by our work and we'll go back and fix it. So, and if more information does come out, then we'll call the museum or wherever the exhibit is on display. Still, the new Carithosaurus mount won't be complete until the head is in place. Despite all the science and technology that went into it, it's now a work of art. That their legs would have to be very, very close to their bodies in order to do that. For Evans, the posture is everything. It's a window into the past, offering one of the few insights into the dinosaur's prehistoric world. I mean, if you look at how we reconstruct hadrosaurs nowadays compared to how the ROM Carithosaurus was mounted or how um, a lot of the famous public images were, you know, before the 1950s, the animal looks, you know, essentially completely different. Um, rather than being sort of a slow moving, awkward, upright animal, it's um, down and it looks uh, much more active and uh, much more agile. But Evans says the remounting of dinosaurs in general reflects a larger dinosaur renaissance that's changing the way we understand them, especially at museums. Changing these dinosaur postures was really on the, on the crest of a wave of a series of other um, scientific discoveries that were overturning um, some of these major ways that we thought about dinosaurs and these old views of dinosaurs as slow and stupid and, and reptile-like. These old ideas were that um, dinosaurs, in fact, didn't have small brains um, for, their, for their body size, that their brains were as large as, um, as would be expected if it was a, a reptile or a crocodile of that body size or even um, higher. Um, certainly some of the smaller carnivorous dinosaurs that are closely related to birds 
uh, had much larger brains than would be expected for, for reptiles of equivalent size. And that brings us to uh, you know, another major uh, paradigm shift that came about in the 70s is the resurrection of the idea that uh, birds are uh, the direct descendants of dinosaurs. And that we know today with the spectacular finds of feathered dinosaurs in China. Uh, and we know that you know, nowadays that uh, uh, birds may in fact be a better model for a lot of dinosaurs in terms of their, their biology and growth rates. The image that emerges of dinosaurs is that they're more complicated and interesting than ever before. They're not as dumb or as cold-blooded or as we thought they were. And uh, you know, we're still doing a lot of work on you know, how, they, how they lived, but they were much more exciting animals than they were thought of in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Really, there's a lot of work going on in trying to figure out how dinosaurs stood and moved right now, and they're bringing in uh, computer animation techniques, basically digitizing the bones and putting them in the computer and testing how these animals may or, or may not have moved and coming up with biomechanical models of how dinosaurs could have stood. So that's why when I say that, uh, you know, we're, we're closer than we were in the 50s, there's still a lot to learn about how, you know, dinosaurs stood and moved, and there's uh, a lot of uh, work yet to be done. If the hadrosaur and its story is anything to go by, our understanding of dinosaurs is constantly evolving. For Peter May, that only means more work. I think a lot of it is, is just it's so unique. You, you know, we'll cast an animal up and um, then we have to mount it. And then you're looking at this cast of a skeleton, or, or in some cases, the actual fossil material, and you just naturally think, what was this thing? You know, like when, when this lived, you know, you're looking uh, I guess, uh, dinosaurs went extinct uh, 65 million years ago. Um, they were probably one of the most successful animals ever in, in the history of the planet. And then you just look at this T-Rex, for instance, and here's this, the largest carnivore ever, just, just staring at you, you know, with the big teeth and the big claws and the big legs, and besides a little hadrosaur, which could have been a meal, an easy meal for it. And your mind just thinks, I, I think, and all day long, you're, you're just wondering, you know, how this thing walked, what it did. You're sticking a rib on, is, is this what the, the rib cage was like? Uh, what did it eat? <laughs> you're putting the ribs together. We find a lot of fossils which have um, scars, injuries to it, and, and then you just think, wow, you know, like it, it broke its foot and it healed. Um, it was bitten here. You, you can see a lot of evidence of things that have happened to the skeletons. And I think it just adds to the day's work. It's not hard to come to work. You know, like, like every day, there's always something new. It's exciting and there's still a lot more out there. You know, like, a, a lot more dinosaurs to be discovered, um, a lot more work to do, and, and a lot of exhibits out there that need updating um, and collections that need fixing. Back at the Royal Ontario Museum, there are many other rare dinosaur bones that have never been seen by the public, at least not yet. When we return, a glimpse at the hidden collection of prehistoric fossils and a preview of the exciting future home of the ROM's new Age of Dinosaurs exhibit. As the rebuilding of the Royal Ontario Museum's dinosaur skeletons continues off-site at Research Casting International, construction on the museum's dramatic new face is in full swing. Of the seven new galleries that will eventually call this new building home, the Age of Dinosaurs gallery promises to be the most dramatic and quite different from its predecessor that existed for over seven decades in the adjacent building. For David Evans, it's a chance to witness the rebirth of the same hadrosaur skeleton that made such an impression on him as a young boy. Not only will dinosaurs like the Carithosaurus and the Albertosaurus look totally different, but much of the ROM's collection of rare fossils will also be on display for the first time. Until then, these priceless prehistoric fossils remain under wraps in parts of the museum that only people with security clearance ever get to see. For example, the old Queen's Park wing that closed to the public in 2004 is one area where bigger specimens currently hang out. Come on in. Welcome to the Jurassic parking lot. This is a sort of a surrealistic space of the old uh, gallery that's been 
dedicated to the temporary storage of some of the specimens that will eventually end up in the new gallery space. This is it, the ROM's most famous dinosaur, Parasaurolophus, still partially encased in its original sandstone matrix. It's the tubular crest of this duckbill dinosaur that makes it so famous. Although widely recognized to kids and dinosaur enthusiasts all over the world, there's only a handful of specimens of this particular type of duckbill dinosaur, and this is the best one. This is actually the original dinosaur gallery here at the ROM, and it were these ceilings that were built extra tall to accommodate the upright Corythosaurus. A prominent figure in this space right now, uh, although temporarily, is Tyrannosaurus rex. T-Rex, like all other Tyrannosaurs, makes a lot more sense with a horizontal backbone. The giant head is counterbalanced by the large tail. He will figure prominently in the new gallery within the crystal, which is just behind these walls here. It'll be this head here that'll be peering out of the crystal gallery, looking menacingly down at passersby on the street. A close relative of Tyrannosaurus rex, Albertosaurus, was also mounted upright in the old galleries. Not anymore. This is the vertebrate paleontology collections here at the ROM. This is the storeroom where all the vertebrate fossils are housed that aren't currently on display. And it's a part of the museum that very few members of the general public actually get to see. This room houses thousands of different fossil bones from many different groups of animals, including mammals, fish, birds, and of course, dinosaurs. And the ROM is very well known for its dinosaur collection. Here we have um, a skeleton of a Velociraptor-like dinosaur, a small theropod from the Cretaceous of Montana. This is Bambi Raptor, and it's about uh, 75 million years old. Uh, below Bambi Raptor is a skeleton of uh, a horned dinosaur. This is the skull of a dinosaur closely related to Triceratops from late Cretaceous of Alberta. The ROM collections uh, themselves are very strong in dinosaurs from Alberta. And as a part of that collection, uh, it's extremely uh, strong in duck-billed dinosaurs. And like this one here, this is a skull of Lambiosaurus, a crested duck-billed dinosaur about 75 million years old. Hadrosaurs are <clears throat> one of the most interesting groups of dinosaurs to study simply because their fossil record is so complete and we have such a large sa sample size where we can get insights into their biology that we simply can't get into uh, other dinosaur groups that simply don't have uh, as good quality of a fossil record. Uh, the Lambiosaurus skulls illustrate the growth and development of the cranial crest, which is so characteristic of the Lambiosaurian dinosaurs, including Corythosaurus, as well as Parasaurolophus and Lambiosaurus. Here is a small juvenile, and here is the crest, and you can see that it's very small relative to the crest in the subadult here, and the much larger crest in the adult Lambiosaurus. This crest becomes more prominent with age and reaches its full expression only at the largest sizes. And this suggests that the uh, showy crests were used in some sort of social uh, function, such as uh, species identification or attracting a mate. The ROM has one of the best skeletons of uh, the duck-billed dinosaur, Myasaura, which is well known for its eggs and nests that have been found uh, in Lake Cretaceous of Montana. This specimen here is a cast of one of the nestlings uh, the specimen at the ROM is a full-size adult, and in the new galleries, this uh, small nestling will contrast the large adult skeleton that we'll have on display. So this is the size of a Myasaura just after hatching from its egg. Uh, we also have uh, a very wide range of other dinosaurs, Ankylosaurs, the armored dinosaurs, uh, Tyrannosaurs, um, which were the, the carnivores of the time, and this uh, is uh, sort of the most fearful carnivore uh, of the late Cretaceous. This is a cast of the skull of Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, you wouldn't want to be looking uh, down its snout um, in that uh, when it was alive. Uh, you can see the teeth here are about six inches long um, and it's grinning with them. Uh, this is the, the largest carnivore that we know of, at least in North America, and one of the largest um, terrestrial carnivores or land-dwelling carnivores um, that ever lived. Uh, some kind of interesting features about the skull, other than the teeth, are <clears throat> the position of the orbits. Uh, this is the eye here, and when you look down the snout, you can see the orbits uh, are actually much wider than the snout itself, which would it would have given Tyrannosaurus uh, some stereoscopic vision, which would have uh, helped in the hunt. This is the actual size. You can see a human would have been a morsel. 
So in this compact storage here is where uh, many of the smaller specimens are kept. Uh, they're kept in, uh, in drawers with multiple specimens per drawer, and there's literally thousands of, of dinosaur fossils in this, this aisle and in the collection here. Uh, you can see in different drawers, uh, they're arranged by, by uh, taxonomic group, by type of animal. Here we have uh, drawers with ankylosaur scutes. Um, these are the, the dermal armor that protected the back and sides of uh, the armored dinosaurs, the ankylosaurs. So we can continue down the aisles. We pass into the hadrosaur section. So here's a series of uh, isolated hand and toe bones from hadrosaurs. And the carnivorous dinosaurs are kept uh, in, in this area here. Uh, some of the more interesting specimens, of course, include the teeth. And looking at the teeth allows us to tell what the different types of animals and dinosaurs ate. And this is a tooth of Albertosaurus, again, from the late Cretaceous of Alberta. It's more around 75 million years ago. You can see it's about three inches long. He was the T-Rex of, of his time, a Albertosaurus. T-Rex lived um, at the very end of the age of dinosaurs, and uh, Albertosaurus lived somewhat earlier. And this is a single tooth, and you can see here along this edge is a series of very fine serrations. They would have acted just like the serrations on a steak knife to uh, help the tooth cut through meat, and they would have also strengthened the tooth um, as it bit down on its prey. One of the exciting things about the new gallery is that many of the specimens that will be on display will be original mounted fossil bone. One thing to note is that uh, some of the skeletons uh, will be cast material, uh, particularly when the specimens are too delicate or of too much research value to be mounted uh, and put on display. So in a case in the terms of the ROM gallery is the Myasaura skeleton. Here is uh, some of the arm bones from the Myasaura, and here are some of the vertebrae. When you look at these bones closely, you can actually see that there's two colors. The dark gray color is the fossil bone itself, and because fossils are seldom perfect, uh, sometimes parts of them have to be uh, sculpted or restored, and that's this white, which is plaster. These original fossils are then casted, and exact replicas of them are made, and these are then put into the mount and then will be on display in the gallery. The ROM's Myasaura skeleton, the cast of it, is uh, currently with Research Casting International. It's been built for a while, but it's there being tweaked for the new gallery. Research Casting International's client list also includes the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, Ontario. Theirs is one of the oldest museum buildings in Canada. And it too is undergoing a huge renovation to update its galleries and provide new spaces for its collections. Phase one of the project, unveiled in October 2006, includes a brand new dinosaur exhibit, the Talisman Energy Fossil Gallery, located in the Victoria Memorial Museum building. Like the ROM, the gallery curators and designers went to great effort to ensure the art of mounting dinosaurs was current with the science of the day. Well, the old exhibit was a much more of an old school exhibit. Some of the science was older and certainly some of the ways that we posed the dinosaurs, the thinking on that has changed. Unlike the old exhibition, which tried to give a sense of the entire uh, run of geological time, we've taken a fairly narrow slice right at about the time that the dinosaurs disappeared and the time that mammals took over. But the ones that we've created as three-dimensional mounts are by and large in what the most current thinking is in terms of their posture, in terms of their stance. There's no guarantee that these are absolutely the final poses, but they do reflect what scientists are telling us now. For instance, uh, T-Rex used to be thought of as a fairly sluggish, slow-moving animal with its tail dragging on the, its gr on the ground and its nose in the air. Well, now it's got its tail out directly behind him and and its uh, head out horizontally almost in, fr in front of them. Most museums now display T-Rex and the large theropods in that kind of pose. But it's not just T-Rex and the other theropods, it's other animals too. And we've, there's a similar debate that's gone on with uh, 
the ceratopsian dinosaurs and whether they had their legs really quite directly underneath them and whether they could run real quick or whether they had the sprawl position and that they were low sluggish kind of animals we changed our pose uh, for for one of them uh, and that debate i don't think has been resolved yet i think that's an ongoing debate so yeah, we may change some of the poses again in the future. There's a lot of preparation work that has to go into them to find them to start with, to get them out of the rock, to prepare them, to mount them, to put them in a position where you can comfortably put them out on exhibition. That takes a lot of time. It takes some very uh, particular expertise. And of course, it takes some money as well. Uh, I think every new museum that opens a fossil exhibition uh, creates uh, a new model, a new step forward, and everybody else tries to learn from what, what everyone else has done. And we're just one step along the way. But right now, I think we've got probably the most elegant, most comprehensive dinosaur gallery that's out there. The ROM has certainly got a new exhibition coming on. Uh, that exhibition, I'm sure, will be different. I mean, they will build on what we've done and what they've seen in other new exhibitions around the world. Uh, they have a different collection, and that will certainly drive, drive the exhibition in, in a different way. They have a different building. That will, you know, put some constraints on, on what they can do and some off, give them some opportunities as well. So it's hard to say. I mean, I suspect they'll take a different thematic approach as well. Uh, however, I'd be surprised if they didn't come here and take a look and see what we've done. The Michael Lee Chin Crystal, still under construction, strikes a stunning contrast to the Royal Ontario Museum's old heritage architecture. It's destined to be a new landmark for the City of Toronto after its scheduled opening later this year. It is part of an ambitious redevelopment and expansion that will finally allow the museum to put its major collections on permanent display including its impressive collection of dinosaur specimens. The huge skeletal mounts and casts we've seen will dominate the new exhibit in this large dynamic space and will be visible from many points inside and outside the new crystal. But the work is far from over. There are still many more dinosaurs to take apart and put back together. And even then, new fossils or findings may emerge that could fundamentally change the way we think about dinosaurs once again. I think that we have it closer to the truth. Um, I think that there's still a lot of work to, to go, you know, in terms of uh, knowing how dinosaurs stood and how they moved is, you know, very difficult. We have their footprints, but we don't have any uh, other, um, we don't have living dinosaurs to, to, to watch move. And so when you just look at their skeletons alone and even skeletons and footprints, you know, how was the leg held? Was it straighter or was it more bent? Some of these questions we, we, don't, we don't know the answers to yet. Sure, we're closer than, than uh, we were in the 40s and 50s and the 60s, but it's something that we're still working towards even now.